everyone. <laughs> so after this difficult year, I'm reminded of a shtetl joke. What's the difference between a Jewish optimist and a Jewish pessimist? The pessimist says, it can't possibly get worse than this. And the optimist says, oh, yes, it can. <laughs> yeah. So the day of the era of Yom Kippur was illustrative of my whole year. I woke up to a text from my friend, Lisa Shimoni in Modi'in, Israel. That morning, her friend's child, Captain Eitan Yitzchak Osher, 22 years old, was the first soldier to be killed in a ground operation in Lebanon. He died in combat with Hezbollah terrorists just two days after Israel launched its land incursion. And once again, I started my cycle of waking up, reaching for my phone, scrolling, and crying. This year has been a year of tears. Tears for our Israeli soldiers, and the 728 troops killed in combat for their families, for the hostages, those killed and those still captured. Tears for the 26,000 rockets fired at Israel and the horror that Israel is now fighting a war on three fronts with Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis and tears for the dramatic rise in anti-Semitism worldwide. And it's not an exaggeration, as Rabbi John Rosov wrote recently, to say that this has been the most horrific, frightening, and sad year in the life of the Jewish people since the Holocaust. And the grief doesn't stop at our door. Tears for Ukrainians, for the Sudanese who face the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Tears for those in the Southeast who have lost their homes due to hurricanes. For the innocent Gazans and Lebanese who are at the mercy of radical Islamic groups. And tears for our own children and grandchildren who are inheriting a world of hate and anger and violence. This year has left a large open wound in our hearts and we're still bleeding. No matter if what your politics are, whether you're a Jew, you love a Jew, or simply you're a living, breathing human being, I imagine part of you is shattered this year. And there's no escaping our reality. As Brett Stevens recently wrote in the New York Times, we Jews, we've always been aware of anti-Semitism, but after October 7th, it became personal, right? It was in the neighborhoods in which we lived, the professions and institutions in which we worked the colleagues which we worked alongside of, the peers whom we socialized with, the group chats we belonged to, the causes we donated to, and the high schools and universities that our kids attend. And since that dreadful day, many of us have just been putting one foot in front of the other. But we're tight, we're wound up, we're tense. 
On the second day of Rosh Hashanah, I spoke about the many reasons why we cry, some beautiful and some tragic. I spoke about the baggage we bring when we witness somebody else crying and why sometimes it's challenging for each of us to cry. We looked at the biggest crier in the whole Hebrew Bible, King David, and the first person to cry in the Torah, Hagar, whose tears saved her son's life. And if you haven't heard my second day sermon, well, it's online, watch me. But today, we're gonna go deeper. Based on Torah, we're going to look at different texts and commentaries about how crying has served the Jewish people over the centuries and how we can hold our pain with our joy. And to be clear, my intention is not to get us crying, but to honor the tears that so many of us have shed this year in anger, in confusion, in frustration, in deep disappointment, and of course, in mourning. To begin our machzor, our high holiday prayer book, it's filled with prayers to elicit tears. After this year, who can read who shall live and who shall die in the, in the Unatana Tokef? without choking up a bit? And who can read Avinu Malkeinu, wipe out every oppressor and adversary without our hearts sinking? And during these challenging times, who can listen to the shofars cry without appreciating the Talmudic teaching that the ram's horn is supposed to sound like the sobs of someone deeply wailing for help. Yet for some of us, the machzor might be an impediment to an open heart. And in that case, remember what the Talmud and Zohar teach, that if we can't pray, the gates of tears are always open, and that there's a heavenly mystical place called the Palace of Tears that no one can gain entrance to except if you're crying. So right now, if the machzor doesn't move you, and you can quote me on this for the rest of the day, close your machzor and open your hearts. Because ultimately our goal is to swim in the Palace of God's Tears however we each get there. And I have to give it to the testosterone-laden rabbis of the Talmud. They modeled crying for us. They go on pages and pages about all the things that make them cry. Rabbis Ami and Asi lament that there's no guarantee things work out well, even when we suffer and try to live a righteous life. And Rav Yosef wails because not only do people die young, but also for no logical reason. And then there's Ra Rabbi Yochanan, who breaks down because bad things often multiply out of control. I think we can all relate to that this year. But I'm also thinking about Ecclesiastes. Maybe you're singing the song in your head too, right? There's a time for everything under the sun, a time for weeping and a time for laughing, a time for wailing and a time for dancing. But why? What is this text saying? That the laughing will one day outweigh the weeping? that our dancing will one day make us forget our wailing? I don't know about you, but I don't buy that theology. 
What's the purpose of all the tears we've shed this year, both individually and collectively? And besides that, do our tears make a difference? On Yom Kippur morning, it's actually traditional to recite Psalm 130. And it begins, Mima'amikim karatiya, from out of the depths I call, I cry to you. Tears from our depths are deep, they're raw, they're unfiltered, they're an expression of the heart. And when we release our tears from our depths, we become one with the universe. Let me explain. Did you know that humans are the only mammals to shed tears? And our bodies are 70% salt water. And our blood plasma matches with the seawater 98%. So when we cry from our depths, we become one with the earth, embraced, absorbed into something greater than us. Crying is our way of becoming an ocean, returning to the womb, to the primordial waters of creation itself which also explains why this afternoon we read from the book of Jonah. Jonah wants to run away from his obligations, and instead he's thrown overboard, surrounded by a huge tear, the ocean, and he sinks deep down to a dark place of depression. And when he reaches the Ma'amikim, the depths, Jonah prays to the eternal from the belly of the fish, saying, in my trouble, I cried out to God. Notice when he hits rock bottom, that's when not only he's surrounded by one big tear, but he cries himself, and those tears allow him to take charge of his life and to take action. His tears don't paralyze him. They clarify for him what's important. I'm reminded of countless inspiring Israelis this year who in the midst of their tears did just that. They took action. They created makeshift kitchens throughout the country to feed soldiers and displaced families. They turned hotels into classrooms in the middle of the desert. And strangers, literally strangers, went from house to house to make sure that people would have a minion in order to say Kaddish for their loved ones. Our people were beaten down. The air was punched out of us. And we got up. We became a shofar. We became a shofar. Chaim of Chernowitz, an 18th century Ukrainian Hasidic rabbi, taught that the shofar illustrates how each of us can leave our narrow, tight places and emerge changed, open to new possibility. Because Think about it. The shofar sound emanates from a confined, small, little place, a mouthpiece. And then with power and precision, air goes through it, and the sound reaches an open space, spreads and grows in strength, ascending higher and higher. Our own private and collective sobs, like the shofar's cry, can move us higher and higher. So if tears 
if tears can be clarifying like Jonah, and they can be expansive like the shofar, how can we access our tears if they don't flow easily? Maybe God can be our teacher. There's a great midrash about God crying. Now, I just want to say at the outset, I don't believe that God's like a person that sits and cries. Just forget that. That's not my theology. I'm not suggesting it should be yours. But this is such a beautiful midrash, so just go with the metaphor. It starts with Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish was a character. He was from the third century. He was a bandit, and he turned into a scholar. And Reish Lakish says that there are three times in history where the angels wanted to cry and God said no. One of them was at the time of the destruction of the temple. And at that moment, God cried, let me weep bitterly, don't comfort me. And then God turned to the angels with a warning. And anyone, anyone who tries to comfort me, you'll be insulting me. I love this midrash. God stands up for the right to cry. There are times simply to shut your mouth when assuaging someone's sadness is damaging. When all there is to say are the Hebrew words, ein milim, there are no words. And then the Midrash continues. And what was God crying when God was weeping? God was crying, woe is me. I used to live with the Jewish people in the temple, but now it's destroyed. And now I'm going to go up to the heavens because I can't be here anymore. And I'm worried that all the nations are going to make a laughing stock of me because ugh, look at what God allowed to happen to God's people. And at that moment, Metatron, who was the archangel of all of the angels, Metatron came up to God and said, oh, Master of the universe, I'll weep instead of you, but please, you, God, shouldn't weep. And then God said, if you don't let me cry, I will disappear from you, I will leave you, and I will go into a secret place that you can't enter, and I will weep by myself. Beautiful teaching. God was weeping, and the angel Metatron couldn't take it. Like a child who sees his parent cry for the first time and feels disoriented or maybe even terrified. But God wouldn't hear of it. Let me cry, and if you don't, I'm going to disappear from you. And then the Midrash continues. God swoops down to earth and finds the prophet Jeremiah. He was the prophet at the time of the destruction of the temple. And he gives Jeremiah instructions. I want you to go find Moses, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Wake them up. Where are they? They're dead. But that doesn't seem to bother God or Jeremiah. So he goes and he gets them from their graves and they're a little disoriented and they're like, what's going on? And God says, I know that you know how to weep. And then God tells them about the destruction of the temple and they weep and scream all together. So beautiful. God models for us the importance of crying and doing so in community. As Tali Adler teaches, the how of mourning is not intuitive. Like so many human activities, to do it well, we need someone to model it for us. Since last Yom Kippur, the world has blown up and threatens to continue to do so. 
and it might do us some good to fight for our right to cry, just like God did, and then place ourselves with people who will allow us to cry and communities that will allow us to cry. And Temple Israel is one of those places. Okay, so you might be thinking, enough of the crying, Michelle. We're a people who hold tears with joy. We're a people who begin again and again. Some of us call us the ever-dying people, and some of us call us ourselves the never-dying people. We have a responsibility to dance again to experience joy again, and to not feel guilty when we're experiencing life's pleasures. And the Israelis themselves have modeled that for us this year. Only eight months after October 7th, 40,000 Israelis gathered for a healing concert in Tel Aviv. There were survivors. There were those abducted and released. There were family members of the atrocities. They danced into the night with their hands in the air, loudly proclaiming, this will not define us. We will love again. We will have joy again. We will thrive again. How have we been doing this? For generations. How have we not only moved forward, but like a shofar, gone higher and higher and higher? A final Talmudic story. Remember the context. It's the year 70. The Romans waged war of annihilation and humiliation against the Jews. They slaughtered the old, the young, the men, the women. Most of those who weren't murdered died from starvation or were brought in chains to Rome to be enslaved, debased, or degraded. Then the Romans burned the temple. This in our Jewish history is referred to as the Horban, the time of total destruction and catastrophe. And as the trauma was rippling through our community in the year 70, and the horror of what happened was sinking in, some survivors became ascetics. How could we possibly eat meat, they, they reasoned, which was sacrificed in the temple on the altar, or drink wine? which was poured as a libation, when every bite and every sip reminds us of the destruction. Essentially, they were rejecting the joys of life because they couldn't imagine holding joy and pain at the same time. So listen to what Rabbi Yoshua said. Okay, all right, no meat, no wine. But then, you know what, you really ought to stop eating bread, too. Because don't you remember the temple offerings that always came with bread? Oh, yeah, okay, so we'll stop eating bread, they said. Okay, we'll just have fruit and vegetables. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, said Rabbi Yoshua. Yeah, you shouldn't really eat fruit, either, because don't you remember the first fruits that used to be brought to the temple, as well? And you know what, you probably shouldn't uh, drink water either because you remember those water libations? Mmm. Stumped. They were silent. Rabbi Yoshua had some advice. My children, he said, hear me out. You must mourn. It's impossible not to mourn. But to mourn too much? To live in perpetual devastation, that's also wrong. Instead, the challenge is to grieve 
and to live. And how do we hold that tension? Rabbi Yeshua actually had some practical gu guidelines. When we paint our homes, leave a little patch unpainted, unfinished, right by the entrance. And when we prepare a, a feast, leave off one delicacy. And when we get dressed, leave off one piece of jewelry. Yes, that's how we live. It's impossible to shake the pain of this past year, and we're still in it, and it's going to continue. But we can't constantly cry. This year, this year, may we find the strength to cry and dance, to weep and laugh, to wail and celebrate. Perhaps not at the same time, perhaps, maybe in the same week, maybe in the same day or hour or even minute. Because life and living is an art. And though the tears may be falling on each of our canvases, we're the artist, and the paintbrush is in each of our hands. May this year be a better year. Gamar Chatima Tova to each of you and to all of your loved ones. And may we go higher and higher. Amen.